Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. We're going to be studying when Jesus responded to the religious leaders when they asked him if he was the Messiah, and he said, I am. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words, and on Fridays I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of that Bible study as well as a video about books. So if you are interested in either of those things, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications to get updates about new videos. So this week is number 12 out of 13 in our Bible study series on the I am statements of Jesus. And if you want to see a list of all the Bible studies I've done, you can go to raise to walk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. And I have a link to all the playlists of all the Bible studies series that I've done now this weekend. So if you watch the whole live stream, Palm Sunday is coming up in a couple days. If you're watching the replay, it will have been yesterday when I publish this. So um, I, I do actually have a Bible study series specifically on Easter and we are coming up into Easter week. And I do have um, a Bible study on the what Passover is and the significance of it. And I'll link to that if you'd like to watch it. So if you'd like to go through the series, I'm going to link to the playlist so you can go through and watch them. If you only watch one other Bible study besides this one in this series, I recommend, uh, it's kind of hard. The first one is actually kind of sets the context quite a bit, but last week's Bible study on when Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, this is repeated in three chapters in the book of Revelation. This ties real closely with this lesson right here because it kind of um, gives a little bit fuller explanation of the full impact of both what Jesus is saying. I am Alpha and Omega, and how that played a role as God come as man to redeem us. So if you don't watch any other one, I recommend going and watching that one. But this statement is found in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 14, verse 62. So if you want to grab your Bibles, go ahead and do that. Um, grab a notepad and a pen if you're able to. And um, But before we get started, let's just start this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this day and for this time, and we invite in the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are a teacher and our guide, and lead us into all understanding. So we rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. Lord, give us eyes to see you clearly, give us ears that can hear your voice, and give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. I plead the blood of Jesus over each person that listens, and I thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to talk a little about these statements. We're going to talk a little bit about the book of Mark. So um, in the main I am statements, the seven that everybody focuses on, is found in the book of John. And in those statements, Jesus identifies himself very clearly with things that God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, has said about himself. And so you'll often see people say that John has a high Christology. And skeptics will sometimes use that to dismiss it because they'll say that John was a late gospel and that this idea of Jesus as God was a late development, that Jesus didn't see himself that way, that his early disciples didn't see Jesus that way, and that regardless of what all the claims that John makes in his gospel about Jesus, that that wasn't what their early disciples thought. So it is true that John was the last gospel to be written. Not only was it the last gospel to be written, but was the last book of the New Testament to be written. It was written close to the end of the first century. But in order to make that claim, you have to ignore two things. The first is that John, who wrote it, was actually the Apostle John that was a disciple of Jesus. And he had been through a lot of tribulations. He was the only one out of the apostles that wasn't martyred. And that wasn't because they didn't try it. He went through a lot of persecutions for this claim that he made. You also have to remember that these were people that were part of their communities. And so uh, many scholars have made the point that when you look at how Christianity began, it began in the place among people where these the disciples were making the claims that these things happened. John was a late gospel, right? It was. But what we're going to be reading out of today is from the Gospel of Mark, which was the very earliest gospel to be written. Most scholars, and then the, I'll link to a video of a guy who graduated from the apologetics program and did his thesis on the dating, or not the dating of the Book of Mark, but the consensus of the dating among modern scholars on the Book of Mark. And the majority of scholars believe that it was written before 70 AD, and most of them believe it was written significantly earlier than that. 
I've mentioned before, I took a class from Nabil Qureshi when I was at the apologetics program. It was actually on Islam and Christianity, but at the time he was working on his dissertation. It was on the dating of the Book of Mark, and he believed that Mark was written in 380 AD and the time of Caligula. Regardless, you can't say that Mark was a late development. It was very early, and so we're going to be looking at the statement about really what he was saying when he's responding to the religious leaders here. So, okay, so we're going to start in Mark 11, and this is just because we're going to kind of give the sequence of events because all this stuff starts happening really quickly. And this starts with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This is known, what is known as Palm Sunday. And this is what we, we observe um, on this Sunday before Easter. So I'm going to read the passage on the triumphal entry and then we're just going to do a quick, a quick overview of what happens in between that event and when Jesus is standing in front of the religious leaders after he's been arrested. Okay, so this is chapter 11, verse 1, reading out of the New Living Translation. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. And this is... Um, fulfilling prophecy in First Samuel six seven and Zechariah nine nine. So I do have a Bible study a couple of years ago where we talk about this specific little occurrence about the donkey and the colt. I'll link to it. Okay, verse four. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, "What are you doing untying that colt?" They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garment over it, and he sat on it. Many of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Praise God in the highest heaven! Okay, so if you have a highlighter, highlight this passage right here. We're going to read this again. And this is making references to Psalms 118, 25 through 26, Isaiah 148, 1. But we're also going to look at what they might have had in mind. And so I'm going to read this verse again. So just picture this scene in your mind. They're coming into Jerusalem. He's riding, he's riding on a donkey's colt. The people are waving branches, laying their coats down so this donkey can, can go over it. It's a big spectacle, right? But imagine yourself in the situation. Like, imagine what this would be like. Let me, let me read this again, what they were saying. Praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heavens. So, here's this guy from Nazareth coming into Jerusalem. The crowd are acknowledging him as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're acknowledging him as this expected Messiah. And not only him as the expected Messiah, but the coming of the kingdom of their ancestor David. So keep in mind that Herod, who is a ruler, is not in the hereditary line of David. He's been appointed there by the Romans. Also, the priests, who this, this coming Messiah is supposed to be both king and priest, is they're also not in the hereditary line of Aaron or the Levites. They are just, they were also appointed there by the Romans. Neither of these authorities, either political or the religious leaders, had any hereditary right there, and they're both totally corrupt and oppressing the people. And I have a Bible study on uh, Lazarus and the rich man where we talk about the family of Annas and how they were just basically like the mob. Okay, so Annas was the power behind the throne and he had his family members, total nepotism in there. And they just, it was just a total racket. So think about this whole scene and think about what kind of drama that might have caused. Who do you think this would have made nervous? It would have made Herod nervous, it would have made the religious leaders nervous, and it would have made the Romans nervous that this is going to cause some trouble where this guy's coming in, right? Okay, so then what happens? So Jesus goes 
into the temple, clears out the temple for a second time. And again, like I said, this was the whole corrupt little commerce system in there was controlled by the family of Annas. So this is a direct attack on their gig, right? He's, he's coming for them. Basically, this is, this is what he's doing here. And then he, there's a whole passage about where he's teaching his disciples about prayer. We go into chapter 12, where he teaches a parable about the evil farmers. So the, the master goes away I have a Bible study video on this. The master goes away and gives the care of his vineyard and his farm to these farmers and they betray his trust. So who is he talking about here? He's talking about the religious leaders that are betraying their God by how they're treating both God and, and his people, right? So let me read this one verse about what he says is going to happen to these evil farmers. Chapter 12, verse 9. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? Jesus asked. I'll tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. Jesus declared war on them. This is, this is what's going on. Major confrontation. Okay. Then he's, the religious leaders are coming and they're questioning him about the resurrection. There's a whole passage in that in chapter 12. This whole section here in, in Mark is really illustrating how much those religious leaders had fallen short of their responsibility, how they were betraying God and how they were betraying the people. And then, um, chapter 13, he's prophesying the destruction of the temple. So he just enters Jerusalem and the religious leaders start plotting to kill Jesus. And this is two days before the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread. Then the disciples preparing for Passover it talks about the last supper. And then they go to the garden to pray and Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested. So then we get to the passage that we're going to be focusing on today. We're going to start in verse 53, chapter 14. They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law had gathered. It's kind of like the secret meeting, right? Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. So it's a secret in the middle of the night. They're plotting this. There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were, were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they couldn't find anything. So what they're trying to do is they personally do not have the authority to put him to death. So they're trying to find a way to get him convicted so that the Romans will put him to death. This is what they're trying to do. If, if they had had the power, it would have already been done by this time, I think. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they couldn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made from no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. So this is... Lesson 12 in our series, we've gone all the time what God, Yahweh, meant when he said, I am. So this is how he identifies himself. He says, I am, identifying himself in that way with God. But then that's not all. That's not all. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. So not only does he say, I am, respond with this with how God identified himself to Abraham. But he says to these priests, and not only that, but you're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. I'm just trying to imagine this for like the tension, because it's it's like they, he's already done all these things. It's really coming directly against them and their authority. It's already told them in the parable of the evil farmers that when the, when the Son of Man comes, that they're going to be, they're, these evil farmers, the people that have betrayed their master, are going to be killed. He's already said this. And so he's now saying to the religious leaders, yeah, I am, and you're going to see it. Totally direct confrontation. This is basically a throwdown, right? And so then in verse 63, then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. So this is in Mark, our very first gospel, right? Jesus did. He very explicitly identified himself as God. And we're going to go a little bit more into 
how they would have understood it. Because sometimes people, a lot of times people will say, well, the Jews didn't have this idea of this, you know, more than one person in the Godhead. That's actually absolutely not true. Um, I linked this last week. I linked to it again this week. I have a review of a book called The Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Siegel, who was an Orthodox Jewish scholar who believed this was a heresy, but he very clearly lines out that this idea of uh, two powers in heaven was a, a commonly held belief in the Second Temple period. So what we're going to be looking at is some passages in the Old Testament that talk about who this one is coming on the clouds of heaven, right? So we covered this quite a bit last week. Uh, this one verse in Psalm 110.1, 1, so this is written by David. This is hundreds of years before. And it's, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. So what does that mean? The Lord said to my Lord, this this one who's be, going to be given power and authority, right? The enemies are going to be made a footstool. And then I'm just going to read this passage out of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And like I said last week, this vision of Daniel's was just a, um, it really shifted the idea of, the theology of the Jews in the Second Temple period, um, what they were looking forward to and their expectations. And the book of Daniel was one of the most widely respected books. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think this is, they had uh, the uh, Essenes at Qumran had more schools of Daniel than I think any other um, book of the Old Testament. So this was right, this was uh, a focal point. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that if you look at modern Judaism, they completely take a detour around the book of Daniel, right? So when you want to look at one of the big differences between Second Temple Judaism and modern Judaism, you can look at Daniel because they don't, they don't even go to there. If you look at the Torah portions, um, they read a bit out of Daniel chapter 1. All of this I'm going to be talking about, nothing, nothing at all. So anyway, this is Daniel's vision. And I'm just going to read verse 13. We, If you want to go into more depth, um, we did cover kind of the significance of this more in last week's Bible study on when Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, and when we're looking at the, those passages in Revelation. And verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him to the one like the Son of Man, was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom, so that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So this is the one, This is these are Old Testament passages, looking at one who is going to be given authority. This is one like a son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. And so the priest asked Jesus, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Do you see why they wanted to kill him? This, this is why, because they didn't, they didn't want that. They were, they were comfortable in their own, you know, their own gig with their own position. And so they don't really, they say they serve God, but they don't really want him around, right? So there's these passages in the Old Testament, these little bits about what is coming. But you might ask, how do we know what the Jews of Jesus' day thought? Well, we, we know a lot of, about it because of the writings of the intertestamental period. So these, this isn't scripture, but we do have writings from that time. And it gives us a picture of how sections of the Jewish people took those passages and synthesized them and the conclusion that they came up with. So you see this a lot in the um, what we know of as the apocryphal books. You see this in some of the non-biblical um, writings that's found in the um, Dead Sea Scrolls about this expectation of this a coming of a righteous teacher, right? And so, but what I'm going to read that specifically relates to this is from First Enoch. So this was found, there were pieces that were found of First Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were written in Aramaic. Um, they believe, before they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, oh, wow, I, I don't think I've ever mentioned this in one of my Bible studies. She only found more Dead Sea Scrolls. They, they found new ones, and they were written in Greek. I just can't wait until they start 
you know, publishing the research on that. That's going to be really awesome to see what they're of and what they have to say. So anyway, going back to this, what these writings show is how the Jews interpreted all these different prophecies, right? And what they were looking forward to. So First Enoch is an intertestamental book. And before they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they thought that First Enoch was maybe written as late as 100 AD. It doesn't even make sense to me because it's quoted in the book of Jude, which was written in the first century, so that doesn't even make sense. But anyway, it, after they found fragments of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls and written in the Aramaic, they realized it had to be written much, much earlier than that. And now, after finding the Dead Sea Scrolls, they believe it was written between 275 BC to 100 BC. These are writings that the Jews of Jesus' day were familiar with. Jude actually references a passage in First Enoch, and so this shows us the ideas that they had. And so I'm going to read some passages referencing the Son of Man in um, First Enoch, and I'm going to link to this in the description, so if you'd like to go and look at this yourself, you can. And you can also, there's some um, publications of the Book of Enoch, too. I, you can find it, like, probably on ccel.org or, you know, find it. Um, a book of Enoch on Amazon, but this has quotes of the references to the Son of Man in First Enoch. We just read what Jesus said, right, about in his response to the religious leaders. We just read this part of this vision of Daniel, and so I'm going to read this out of the book of Enoch, and let's just see how how these line up. Okay, so this is in 46, 1 through 4. And there I saw the one to whom belongs the time before time. And his head was white like wool. With him was another being, whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness, like one of the holy angels. I asked the angel who was with me, concerning that son, and of who he was, and whence he was, and why he went with the one to whom belongs time before time. He answered and said to me, This is the son of man who has righteousness with whom dwells righteousness and who reveals all the treasures of that which is hidden because the Lord of the spirits has chosen him and whose lot has a preeminence before the Lord of the spirits in uprightness forever. This son of man whom you have seen shall raise up the kings and mighty from their seats and the strong from their thrones and shall loosen the reins of the strong and break the teeth of the sinners. Okay, this is in 48, 2 through 10. And at that hour, that son of man was named in the presence of the Lord of the spirits and his name before the one to whom belongs the time before time. Yes, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of all spirits. He shall be a staff to the righteous, whereupon to save themselves and not fall. And he shall be the light of the Gentiles and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. All who dwell on the earth shall fall down and worship before him and will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of the spirits. For this reason, he has been chosen and hidden before him, before the creation of the world and forevermore. The wisdom of the Lord of the spirits has revealed him to the holy and righteous. For he has preserved the lot of the righteous because they have hated and despised this world of unrighteousness and have hated in all its works and ways in the name of the Lord of the spirits for in his name, they are saved. And according to his good pleasure, it has been in regard to their life. So there's so many things in this, this passage here. And it's like talking about, you know, the one who belongs to the time before time is talking about all the nations of the world will, will be coming, worshiping him. He will be the light of the Gentiles um, it's talking about this unifying the people through this son of man, right? And that people will be saved in his name. So this is probably written 200 years before the time of Christ. These were the ideas that were out there, right? Okay, so um, continuing on. In these days, downcast and countenance shall the kings of the earth have become, and the strong who possess the land because of the works of their hands. For on the day of their anguish and affliction, they shall not be able to save themselves. And I will give them over into the hands of my elect as straw in the fire. So they shall burn before the face of the holy as lead in water. They shall sink before the face of the righteous and no trace of them shall any more be found. So 
that whole reference about the hay and stubble, right? This is a direct reference, isn't it? And on that day of their affliction, there shall be rest on the earth, and before them they shall fall and not rise again. There shall be no one to take them with his hands and raise them, for they have denied the Lord of spirits and his Messiah. And the name of the Lord of the spirits shall be blessed. This is something that was written. Again, it's not it's not scripture, but this is something that was written. Taking all these passages in scripture into account, right? Okay. So we're going to go to Psalms 21. And this is, again, predates all of this, but we're going to look at what this end promise is. And this is a Psalm of David. Verse 1, How the king rejoices in your strength, O Lord. He shouts with joy because you give him victory. For you have given him his heart's desires. You have withheld nothing he has requested. You welcomed him back with success and prosperity. You placed a crown of finest gold on his head. He asked you to preserve his life. And you granted his request. The days of his life stretch on forever. This everlasting kingdom, right? Your victory brings him great honor, and you have clothed him with splendor and majesty. You have endowed him with eternal blessings and given him the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. The unfailing love of the Most High will keep him from stumbling. You will capture all your enemies. What is this passage of Daniel talking about? is that the Son of Man, this one along with the Ancient of Days, will have authority over all the kings and the rulers of the earth, and his kingdom will be everlasting. It will have no end, right? Okay, this is what's being described here. You will capture all your enemies. Your strong right hand will seize all who hate you. You will throw them into a flaming furnace when you appear. So we just read in Enoch, isn't it? Yeah. The Lord will consume them in his anger. Fire will devour them. You will wipe their children from the face of the earth. They will never have descendants, although they plot against you. Their evil schemes will never succeed, for they will turn and run when they see your arrows aimed at them. Rise up, O Lord, in your power. With music and singing, we celebrate your mighty acts. So let's go back and read what Jesus was greeted with in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Praise God. Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of your ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. And then he says in Mark 14, 62, after the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see, Son of Man, seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. So when Jesus said, I am, I am the Son of the Messiah, he's talking about he is... God come as man, the one who will do what David could not, right? He couldn't bring peace. He couldn't unite people. He couldn't even unify his own family because David's family was a mess, right? But Jesus not only reconciles you know, the Jewish people, but the entire world into one people. He's the light of the Gentiles. He unites all people into himself. He brings this reconciliation with God and will bring this peace that all these things that rise up against God that there will come a day when this period of grace, right? God is giving time for people to turn to him, but that at some point that time is going to come to an end and he's going to bring about righteousness and justice and everyone will be judged. When people resist the idea of hell, it's not a new thing, right? It's We see in Psalm 21 that God is going to judge and the judgment will be fire. We see this in Enoch that people who stand up in rebellion against God, that there's going to be a, come an end to that. And what we see when Jesus is saying, I'm coming in the clouds of heaven, I'm coming to judge. He was, this was a direct confrontation to those religious leaders saying your day is coming. When we talk about the second coming of Jesus, it's something that we look forward to, but we also have to remember that with that comes judgment. I did a, a Bible study on the parable of the fish and the net, which was actually a modification of Aesop's fable. So the the story was that this is Jesus's parable is drawing from, is that the king is playing a flute to the fish, trying to draw them to him. But when he draws them in on the net, they're not going to have a choice whether they're going to come or not. So people have a choice. They can choose God or not. But if they don't choose to come to him willingly, 
in the end, there's going to be judgment, one way or the other. You're going to stand before him, and you will either be standing before him on his side, or you're going to be standing in judgment. It, that's just the way, the way it is. There's We don't get to set the rules. We don't get to set our own reality. We don't get to set um, what's okay and what's not. We answer to God whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. It doesn't change what reality is. And so today we have a choice. Tomorrow you might not. And so if you haven't made the choice to come to, to make Jesus the Lord, to come into communion with God, I hope, I hope that you do. And if you've never actually made that choice and you are just, um, think that because you're around people who are Christianish or you've spent a lot, a lot of time in church or, you know, you think that Jesus is kind of cool, that's, that's not what it is. We, we have to recognize that we're sinners in need of a savior and that recognize that Jesus is it. So in Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him to, from the dead, you'll be saved. We have to make a choice. The day of choice for those religious leaders was when Jesus was standing before them and they denied him and what happened. And I think this is kind of interesting in the book of Enoch that um, there's a sense of hiddenness that not everyone's going to recognize him, that the righteous will be, will recognize him and that the unrighteous won't. And that's what happened with his first coming. But in the second coming, everyone's going to realize who he is. So we, we studied that last week. Um, when we looked at Zechariah 12.10, and so I will pour out a, a spirit of grace and supplication on the house of David and all of Jerusalem, and they will look upon me who they have pierced and mourned him as a son they have lost. Right? So if you have people in your life that haven't made that decision, then that's a good thing to be praying for them, is that God will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication on them, so that like Paul, the scales from their eyes will be removed, and they'll be able to see Jesus for who he is. Not only see Jesus for who he is, but also their own need for him. We have to realize that we're a sinner before we recognize that we need a savior. As we're coming into Easter week, let's just keep that in mind, have a list of people that you're praying for. Again, I do have a Bible study uh, series on Easter. So if you're going into this and you're inviting somebody to Easter or services and they have a question, well, I don't even understand the point, you know, then that's what that series is. Why Jesus had to die on the cross what it meant. I have a, a video specifically dedicated to Passover. You can see how the whole story of the Bible is leading to the coming of Jesus. So anyway, let's just end this with a prayer. Lord, we thank you for being with us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our savior and our deliverer and our redeemer. And we thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us in all things. And I, I pray for each person that listens that they, as their heart draws closer to you during this, this Easter season, that they also have a heart for those who still don't know you. Help us to be a light and a witness for you, Lord. And I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we're going to call it a day. I hope you have a great week, and I will see you next time.